Oh, clap your hands, O oh ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on, open up your mouth and shout unto God as you clap your hands. Thank you, Lord Jesus. To the book of Joshua, chapter 10. Joshua, chapter 10. Starting at verse 12, reading down through to verse 14, Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 through verse 14. If you have it, would you shout glory? glory. Let's read this out loud together. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites, before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, and the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for... I want you to read with me just one more time. Amen. Just verse 13. Would you read that out one more time with me? And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a hole. I want to speak to you on this subject tonight. It's time for revenge. It's time for revenge. Just give somebody a bump with the fist and tell them I, I'm ready for some revenge. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready for some revenge. I, I need some revenge. Before you're seated, just lift your hands to him one more time and just worship him and prepare preparation for his spirit. We love you so much. We appreciate you. We thank you. We adore you. We, we're so grateful to who you are and to what you're saying. We Thou art God and God alone. Hallelujah. 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 The Lord bless you. Thank you as you're seated in his wonderful presence. I know that we have passed by Mother's Day, but somehow I just felt it was appropriate even still to give tribute to mothers. And so I just wanted to read this tribute to mothers. It just says, Ten reasons I owe my mother. Number one, my mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. She would say, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. My mother taught me religion. You better pray that will come out of the carpet. My mother taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. My mother taught me logic because I said so. That's why. My mother taught me irony. Keep crying and I'll give you something to cry about. My mother taught me about weather. This room of yours looks as if a tornado went through it. My mother taught me the circle of life. I brought you in this world. <laughs> My mother taught me about receiving. You are going to get it when we get home. My mother taught me about humor. 
when that lawnmower cuts off your foot, don't come running to me. <laughs> and my favorite, my mother taught me genetics. You're just like your father. <laughs> Someone say, thank God for mothers. <laughs> Amen. Joshua chapter 10, we're looking at the scripture here because the Bible brings forth at times some very interesting things. And if you're not careful, the scriptures will appear as if they contradict themselves because we know what Romans quotes in chapter 12 where he says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And so it, was, it would appear at first as if we were in contradiction with each other, but what you discover from scripture is that the Bible is interwoven and it takes the spirit to cause you to understand the word. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If you do not gain understanding from the spirit of the Lord, you will misinterpret the word of the Lord. That's why I would say again to some of you, be careful of the books that you're reading, the things that you're looking at, especially when the person you're reading from doesn't have the Holy Ghost. Because it takes the Holy Ghost to interpret the word. And so just because somebody's got some good theological points doesn't mean they've got proper understanding of the word of the Lord if they don't possess the spirit of the Lord. Amen. And so it is by this that we are going to begin to remove through scriptural understandings tonight. And as we are closing out this, this part, and it doesn't mean that, as our pastor used to tell us, don't let the revival leave in the evangelist's back pocket. And all our pastor meant by that is don't come into the next service and act like you don't know who Jesus is. <laughs> Keep what God gave you. You've got to maintain what you've obtained so that you might continue to gain. And so we're going to back up here in the book of Joshua just a moment and uh, gain some further understandings. Now we're in Joshua chapter 7 right now. Joshua chapter 7. And uh, before we start into the verse, I will... Uh, I'll go ahead and give you the verse where we're at in Joshua chapter 7, but I'm going to start discussing chapter 6 first as a prelude to chapter 7 uh, so that you understand the scenario and the situations that we're dealing with. In Joshua chapter 7, uh, we'll look at verse 2, verse 2 and verse 3. But let me discuss the scenario in Joshua chapter 6. You remember it's the battle of Jericho. And God has spoken that he's ready to take Jericho down. But the Bible tells us that Joshua went off by himself and someone appears to Joshua and Joshua looks at them and says, whose side are you on? And he says, I'm on the Lord's side. And he said, take off your shoe for the ground you stand on is holy ground. You know God is amazing. He told Moses, take off your shoes. He told Joshua, take off your shoe. And so he said, I want to just enter into conversation with you. Conversation is this. I want to teach you how to dominate. Mm -hmm. and this is how you're going to dominate. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 1 or so, the Bible says that, that Joshua encircled Jericho so that none came out and none came in. He shut it up. And one of the things that God has got to train you to do is when you want to handle life's problems, especially when they're dealing with your head, you've got to learn to shut some stuff up. Stop letting negativity come in and stop letting negativity go out. Shut it up. And he gives him the keys, and I won't discuss all what he did to show him deliverance to bring about Jericho. Jericho was a huge place, and it was a mighty victory. But can I tell you when many times we are the most vulnerable, it's after a mighty victory. If you're not careful after a mighty victory, you can get rather cocky. That's what happened here in Joshua 7. They got cocky. Ahai was nowhere near the size of Jericho. It was not a formidable city. It was not something that, well, if we can wipe out Jericho, we ain't going to have no problem at all with Ahai. And so I want you to hear this in Joshua chapter 7. Listen to this in verse 2. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth-Avon on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up, view the country. And the men went up, and they viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, 
Let not all the people go up. Let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. Make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. We don't need everybody to get involved in this. That this is a small little problem. We can handle this with ease. The Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. That's why many times we get into trouble with church because someone has cancer and everybody starts to come out and pray. But now the church has a little financial problem and only a few come out to pray. Mm -hmm. You must know that God always wants us to join forces together and collectively come together and lift our voices no matter what the situation is. I want you to make note of this. In Joshua chapter 6, Joshua had sought the counsel of the Lord. In chapter 7, he's listening to his elders. He's listening to his men. He didn't ask counsel from God. Tell your neighbor, that's always trouble. He was taking the voice of the experts. But he didn't take the voice of God. The expert. And, and so listen to verse 4. So they went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ahai. And verse 5, And the men of Ahai smote of them about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them. 36 men died in the battlefield. Now maybe you don't get the significance of this, but under the regime of Moses, when God told Moses to go into battle with Israel, if God sent them in, we have no record of Israel losing anybody in battle. However went in is however came out. Now this is first Joshua, this is the first time Joshua's going to battle without Moses. And they're looking at, other than just Jericho, and they're looking at his leadership. And now 36 men lay dead in the battlefield, and it's Joshua's fault. You must understand the significance of this. According to the law of the Lord, no man could go to war unless he was 21 years of age. And then the Bible also declared that if he was to go to war, if he was married, he had to be with his wife at least a year. And so here's the understanding. If he was with his wife at least a year, you know there are going to be some children. So these were not just 36 men dead in the battlefield. These were widows and orphans in the congregation of the righteous, and it was Joshua's fault. May I tell you what a lot of us would have done at this point? We would have called together a meeting and said, listen, I can't do this. We need to find ourselves another leader. I'm messing up. I can't do this. I can't have this on my conscience. Not Joshua. He fell back down on his face and this time consults the Lord. And the Lord says, get up. There's sin in the camp. And God takes him through the tribes into the individual families until he finds Achan. And God gets rid of Achan out of the household of Israel. That was another rock concert we were talking about before. They stone him. The Bible said they even stoned the, the animals they had. Fido had to go. Stoned everybody associated with it because God was getting an understanding amongst Israel that you cannot act independent of me. You've got to act along with me. Somebody lift your hands if you believe that and just love him right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible then states that Joshua then goes back, seeks the face of the Lord, and finds the method to defeat Ahai, and he just does that. He defeats Ahai. But now let's go to Joshua chapter 9, and now let's start at verse 13. Joshua chapter 9, verse 13. Now another situation arises. The men of Gibeon, the Gibeonites, come to Joshua, and they declare unto him that we have moldy bread and broken wineskins. And that we've come from a far away journey. And the Bible then says that Israel took of their victuals. Made a covenant with them that they would not harm them. And then I want you to see this. And they asked not counsel. Out of the mouth of the Lord. And may I tell you that the reason why a lot of you are struggling, you don't ask God. You go and buy that car, 
And then when the car spends more time in the mechanic shop than it does on the road, then you want to ask God, and then you're mad at God. I don't understand why you didn't bless me. You know I need a car. You didn't ask. You did it on your own, you're on your own. Amen. Since you think you're smarter than God and you figure you'll turn to popular mechanics and you figure you'll go and look at Consumer Report and you figure that that's better information than God, go at it. Aren't you glad he's merciful? I said, aren't you glad he's merciful? The Bible says that three days later they found out that the Gibeonites were their next door neighbors. Now there's another problem. God is a covenant keeping God. And God's going to make them keep that covenant. Let me tell you how far God made them keep that covenant. 500 years later, David is sitting on the throne. Famine hits the land. David knows that if famine hits the land, God's not happy about something. Duh, duh. And so David goes to God and says, what's wrong? What did we do? God says, you didn't do anything. Saul killed the Gibeonites. God was enforcing the covenant 500 years later. That's how far-reaching Joshua's mistake was. God needs you to understand that some choices that you're making right now that you think are no big deal that are affecting you for the moment, they're affecting your future. Because you veered off and took that path, you went off the wrong path you should have been on, and therefore now, because it's taking you a long time to get back on the right path, you done missed a whole lot of stuff you should have had to be correct on the right path which you're now on. Now come back to Joshua chapter 10. <laughs> Start back at verse 12. You've got to get this. Joshua 10 verse 12. Joshua made a covenant with the Gibeonites he should not have made. He cannot, he cannot properly execute the law of the Lord now that told him to, to wipe out everybody in the land. And now the Gibeonites have called for him to get into battle. Joshua chapter 10, verse 12. The Gibeonites have called for him to get into battle. Now he's in a battle he doesn't belong in because now he's got to take on five nations at once. So now he's bringing his men into a battle they really shouldn't be in because of his mistake as a leader. Now watch Joshua. If, again, if this has been a lot of you, you can lay down, quit, give up, get on a guilt trip. Not Joshua. Joshua went into the battle and started fighting, and the sun started going down. He had a problem with that. I don't want to wait till tomorrow to get these guys. I want them now. So he looks up at the heavens and points his finger at the sun and says, stand still. Looks over at the moon and says, don't you get up. Don't you rise. How do you have the nerve to do this after you've made so many mistakes? How do you have the nerve to do this after you've cost people their lives? How do you have the nerve to do this after you made a covenant you should not have made until you cannot fulfill the law of the Lord? How do, you, how, how do you have the, the audacity? How is it that you actually can believe now that you can speak and do a miracle that even your predecessor Moses never did? Here comes the answer. Come down into verse 13. Here is your answer. And the people were not content until they had avenged, which is to get revenge. They had avenged themselves upon their enemies. God saw that they wanted revenge. And God stopped the sun and stopped the moon to give it to them. Joshua said, I lost 36 men and I have widows and orphans and the congregation of the righteous. It's my fault. I made a covenant with the Gibeonites I never should have made. Cannot fulfill the law of the Lord to totality. It's my fault. Now I'm going to take five kings and all their army in return. That's a fair exchange.
Now you've got to watch this aspect of revenge. We're still in chapter 10. Come to verse 24 now. Verse 24. We're still in chapter 10 of Joshua. Joshua said, I want revenge. And you've got to understand that when he says, son, stand thou still, you've only got a few possibilities of what happened. Now remember, he did not understand from a scientific aspect that the sun did not move. He saw the sun go across the horizon. It was not till Galileo, really, with the telescope that understanding was given. So then what really happened? You've only got two things. Either one, God stopped the rotation of the earth, which means God put gravity somehow on hold. Because it's by the rotation of the earth that we have gravity. Or number two, God bent light. God began to bend the light till it went around the earth. To the spot where Joshua was. You got to watch God. Things that shouldn't be able to stand still, God can make them stand still for you. And where it should be darkness, God can bend the light. If you'll just want revenge. Now chapter 10 where we're at in verse 24. The Bible says that Joshua told the kings. He said get these kings out. And listen to this. He says to his captains. He says come near to these kings. Put your foot on their necks. He said so shall the Lord do unto all of your enemies. Did you see this? Look what Joshua did. He made this a lesson. He said, let me train you what you do when you get into trouble. Let me train you that when you mess up, don't you fold up, but stand back up and ask God for revenge and get ready to put your foot on the neck of your enemy. Someone say, thank you, Jesus. Go to verse 25 so you can see this to the rest of what he's saying because he said I want you to learn to put your feet on the enemy's neck and listen to this he said now fear not nor be dismayed be strong and of a good courage for so shall the Lord do to all how do you have the nerve to say this in light of what you've done because I understand the principle of revenge this is something the church has missed let's go on I'm going to tie it down so we get more understanding. But let's go on just a moment. Let's come now to the book of Judges. And let's look at the story of Samson in chapter 16 of the book of Judges. We will begin in verse 28. In fact, I'll back up to verse 27. Judges chapter 16, verse 27. We remember the story of Samson. You know the story of Samson. He puts his head in the lap of Delilah. Now can I tell you this right now? Your hormones will turn you into a piece of bread no matter how strong you are. A lot of things God tells you to fight, but one of the things God does never tell you to fight is your hormones. He says, flee youthful lust. Run! too strong for you. I made it stronger than you. You better learn how to run. Amen? Mm-hmm. I was, uh, you know, when I was on Martha's Vineyard, I was traveling down there to the road where there's a beach, and one of, the, one of the brothers was witnessing to the sister, or this lady that had, I seen more cotton in an aspirin bottle than what she was wearing. He trying to tell her, the Lord said, would you please go get him? All right, Lord. So I pulled over. I said, brother, psst, come here. He said, oh, I'm telling her about Jesus. No, brother, give her the track and run. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Joseph had the right idea. You want the coat? See ya. Don't want to be ya. Now, unfortunately, Samson did not learn that lesson. Samson could rip doors that weighed tons off of their hinges. Samson did superhuman strength, but he never learned to control his own appetites. He was never strong enough to control himself. You can do all these tremendous works of productivity to where people look at you and compliment you, 
but you got to be able to control yourself. Say amen. Now, because he did not control himself, his eyes are plucked out. He's blinded because he put his head in the lap of the world. And he lied three times to this woman. He lied to her. God-fearing man made covenant lies. Now the end results, his eyes are plucked out. And now he's in the temple of the Philistines and they're making fun of him. Now listen to this based on verse 27. The Bible says, now the house was full of the men and women and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And they were upon the roof and about, everyone say, 3,000 men and women. And beheld that they beheld while Samson made sport. Means they were making fun of him. They were ridiculing him. Samson called unto the Lord. When people make fun of you, start calling unto God. He didn't say fight it yourself. He said start calling to God. Listen to what he said. He said, Lord, he said, oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee only this once, oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two wives. The men, they, you don't get it, they understood the principle of revenge. Samson, this is your fault. If you would just have learned to control your own appetites, you would have not been in this situation. If you'd learned to control your own desires, you would have not been found here. Here you are now with your eyes plucked out and you have the nerve to ask God for revenge for your two eyes. It's your fault they were plucked out. He says, avenge me of the Philistines for my, my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon the house and st that he stood on, which was borne up on the one with the right hand, the other with the left. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. That's, why he only, uh, that's the only reason why he ended up dying, because he asked to die. He bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon of all the people that were in, therein. So, so the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. The Bible said that Samson ruled or judged Israel for 20 years. He slew more in one act of revenge than he did in 20 years of judging Israel. Somebody lift your hand and say, Lord, I'm ready for revenge. Now let's come and fine tune this so we understand what God means by revenge. Does that mean I'm able to go after a person that hurt me? Does that mean I can run them over? Can that, does that mean I can have some hot water with some tea and, and go, oh, sorry. <laughs> Somebody said amen for that. Okay. So what, what does that mean? Come to Proverbs so that you understand what that means. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30 and 31. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30 and 31, so that you understand what God means by granting you revenge. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30 and 31. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul. But listen to this. But if he be found, he must restore sevenfold. He must give all the substance of his house. Now let's go to St. John chapter 10, verse 10. So that we may understand the reference, because this verse in Proverbs is truly dealing with a natural thief. But go to St. John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief cometh forth to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come that you might have, and have it. So the ultimate thief is the devil. And so what God is offering you revenge against is Satan. Well, let's fine-tune this a little bit more. I know sometimes we sing songs like I'm going up to the enemy's camp and I'm going to take back what he stole from me. Now, if you want to do that, you go right ahead. I want sevenfold. 
walk with me, talk with me. Because, see, what happens is that even the world gives you compensation. I don't want what you stole back from me. Give it back with some interest. Do you remember the situation that was hit public? It was national news of this woman that went to McDonald's and got a cup of coffee. Girlfriend put some hot coffee between her thighs and got burned. Duh, you think? But the court gave her millions of dollars in compensation. Everybody was trying to burn their thighs then. And the reason why the court did this is because the court said McDonald's was 15 degrees over the heated temperature by law. And so the court said it was not enough to pay for the pain or for the medication and for the treatment, but you must pay for her pain and suffering of the terror of her while driving. She could have killed somebody or wrecked. And then you look at God, and you only want to get back what the devil stole? I don't think so. Give it back, someone say, sevenfold. Now, go back again to Proverbs 6, because I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Proverbs 6, you've got to see this again, where we just were in, in verse 31. Verse 31, you've got to see this again. Verse 31, Proverbs 6, verse 31. You, you, you got to get this now. I, I want to tell you why a lot of us are not getting revenge. Here's the key. <clears throat> Everybody say this. If he be found. Everyone say if. <clears throat> if you don't find the thief, he keeps stealing. Brother Gurley, if I hurt you and you blame me, you have not found the thief. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. For we wrestle not against... So whenever you're blaming flesh and blood, you have not found the thief. So if you keep blaming yourself, keep blaming your daddy, keep blaming your mama, keep blaming your friend, keep blaming your teacher, keep blaming your spouse. As I heard one wife tell me, she said, I found out that I'm sleeping with the enemy. She was talking about her spouse. <laughs> as long as you blame somebody of the flesh you can't get sevenfold you know the old saying don't shoot till you see the white of their eyes so the enemy came over with sunglasses on you must recognize him no matter how he comes if he be found he must restore So when God offers you revenge, what God is telling you is, I want you to go after, not the puppet, but the hand. The puppet is the person. The hand is the spirit that's controlling the person. If you were molested, don't go after per se just the first person. Go after the spirit of molestation. Because what you will discover, it's a spirit of perversion. And what's going on is many times it's a generational curse. And if you don't stop it, it's heading for somebody else in your family. Somebody shout sevenfold. So what God's saying is I'm giving you a sevenfold return on all spirits that have come against you. The devil that amen tricked you up and tripped you up. I want to give it to you. Someone shout sevenfold. So what God is saying is I'll give you a sevenfold joy. I'll give you a sevenfold peace. I'll give you a sevenfold strength. Oh God. I'll give it back to you sevenfold. A couple years ago, I was going to this church to preach, and 
This man was a bishop within his organization. He was writing some books on ministerial ethics. He said, preachers don't treat people right. And we need to get some understandings amongst ourselves. Amen, sir. I agree. He gave me a check, very sizable amount for the days I was there, about 3500 And he said, could you wait a day or so? Just need to deposit some things. Not a problem. Waited much longer than he asked. Deposited, and the check bounced. Now, I'm just as human as you are. My flesh was talking in my head. This is why you got to be careful that your horns don't hold up your halo. And so, my flesh was saying, you want to write a book on ministerial ethics, make sure you put your name in it. <laughs> my, flesh, my flesh was looking at this and saying, how do you do this? And the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, I have to let the thief steal from you so I can give you sevenfold. Watch this, watch this. He said, you've been asking me for financial increase. So I had to let the thief steal from you so you could get increase. He said, so you can get mad if you want to and go after the person and you'll get back the 3500 or you can ask for sevenfold of the 3500 This is what you want to call basic math right here. <laughs> so I began to ask God, and you supply this, work this thing out. And, and God said, not a problem. And he said, just thank me and praise me and keep going on your way. And whenever the devil brings it to your mind, just thank me for handling it. I went to this church. It was not a large church. It was a pretty small church. And all of a sudden, at the end of the week, God, they wrote out a check for 10000 God just started sending thousands upon thousands in different ways. And by the time the thing was over, I was like, let's do this again. Steal from me again. I like this. <laughs> Does anybody understand that, see, what many of you do not understand is you're so grieving over your losses that you do not understand that the reason why sometimes God lets you have a loss is so that you can have a gain. Somebody shout sevenfold. So now look at for a moment. Look here what he says at the scripture. And, and, and just so you get understanding, go to Psalm 27 verse 10. Psalm 27 verse 10. Um, because when God really wants you to get some great gain, he's going to let you have some great losses. Psalm 27 verse 10. And if you understand that, friend, you don't have to wait for the battle to be over, but you can shout right You can shout about it right now. Oh, come on. Praise him on credit because he's good for it. Woo. Hallelujah. So now look what he says. When mother and father forsake me not if when it means it's only a matter of time whether they forsake you as in to reject you here on earth or whether they die and leave you here but in some way all parents must forsake their children and so he said when this happens the Lord shall do what uh-huh so now watch this I was forsaken in order to be taken. I was rejected in order to be accepted. Now, I have a choice. I can cry over the rejection of a natural daddy, or I can rejoice over the acceptance of a supernatural daddy. Oh, that sounded like sevenfold to me. <laughs> uh, now, see how this works. Parents, you understand this 
those of you at times have watched children, you understand this. You have prepared a meal for a child. Maybe we even bought the meal. You have just put it down on the table and you've called the child to the table. Maybe it's even their favorite meal. Something they may even have requested. They come to the table and they start picking at the meal. And you finally look at them and say, okay, what you've been eating? And they start talking about junk food. They start talking about candy and soda and potato chips. So you know what you do? You limit how much junk food they can have or you stop it altogether. And they look at you many times and say, say, you're mean. And you accept the label of them calling you mean in order to preserve their teeth and to preserve their bodies. And so God has said to some of you, the reason why you did not have proper relationships with a father or a mother or proper relationships, amen, with someone you loved is because of, I knew if I let you fill up on the junk food of human love, you would not have hungered for the good food of divine love. So I limited or stopped altogether how much love I would let you receive so that you would hunger for the divine love and tell somebody it worked. I'm here. It worked. I'm here seeking after God. Hallelujah. So now God said you have a choice. When you watch the devil steal from you, you can either sit back and get upset about it, or you can now begin to ask God for revenge. Somebody shout sevenfold. When I learned this lesson many, many years ago, it was my sister that had called me at one time, had told me that she had saved up some money. Parents, you understand, her children were young at the time, and she had not been able to buy any new clothes for herself. And she finally saved up about $500 so she could get some new clothes. Oh, well, this was about, I don't know, 14 years ago. So she could get some new clothes for herself. And then she called me up about a week or so later and said, well, you know, thank the Lord. I said, wonderful, what are you thanking him for? And she said, well, our car just broke down, and uh, we just found out that it, it's, the tune-up is going to cost $600. Well, thank God, at least I had 500 I said, thank God, I smell a thief. I, you mean you just got the money together and your car just happened to break down at the moment that you collected the money? I smell a thief up in the house. Go and pay your money, honey. Go pay the bill, but claim your sevenfold. And get ready for God to bless you with some clothes. She claimed sevenfold from the 500. She called me back a few days later. She said, you're not going to believe this. I said, try me. I'm in the believing mood. And so she said, she said, my sister-in-law works for a bank and she gets a stipend. She gets money for clothing. And so she just got in her stipend and she just brought over brand new bags of clothes to me with tags still on them. Christian Dior, all kinds of name brands, over $3,000 worth of brand new clothing I said the sevenfold works Woo! you need to claim sevenfold so so even when it's your fault God has arranged it even when it's your fault like it was Samson's fault like it was Joshua's fault if you look at God and say but give me sevenfold I know it was the thief that stole from me he tempted me and I gave into it but restore my family back seven give me back my marriage sevenfold Hallelujah. Give me back my ministry. Seven. Hallelujah. 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 I, I've, been leaving, I've been living this principle for many, many years. And I thank God for this thing because this, this is liberating. Because I don't know about you, but I make a lot of mistakes sometimes. And God just got to help. And this was quite a few years ago, but I was going over to Scotland to teach a men's retreat. And I had just flown in that Monday, and I was just so tired, I just wanted a bed. I was ready for some meditation. you understand. And I was ready to get spiritual with St. Mattress. 
Yes, I was feeling that. Yes, and so and so, uh, I rose up the next day, and I was kind of in a fog just from being tired and doing a lot of stuff. And all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me and said, "Son, you really need to check your ticket." And I checked my ticket. My flight was actually out for that day. I was sure it was for Wednesday, but it was out for that Tuesday. I said, Lord, what am I going to do? He said, oh, call the airlines. And I called them. They said, well, we understand, sir. Things like that happen. Oh, that's so kind of you. But, uh uh-oh. But we're going to have to charge you the present day flight, what it would cost if you bought that ticket the present day, minus what you paid. So you will owe an additional $500. Mm, You smoking something. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Woo, crack is whack, get off it. <laughs> so, uh, Lord, what do I do? God said, oh, don't worry about it, claim sevenfold. Yeah, well, I began to claim sevenfold, and I got myself up to the airport, and I was up there a little bit early, and I went up to the counter, and as I went to the counter to check in, and she went on the computer, she said, oh, I see that you owe us $500. She said, but just wait a moment, sir. And she's typing away. She said, listen, there is a storm that just happened to be moving into Boston, and it has caused us to cancel your original flight, and so therefore I'm going to put you on a new flight, and because I'm putting you on a new flight, I waive the $500. There just happened to be a storm just only on my flight. That's not a coincidence, that's a Christ incidence. I went walking down the jetway, I went walking down the jetway telling the devil, if you think that's sevenfold, you out your ever loving little mind. Because I'm going to teach this thing and spread this thing. I went to Scotland and started teaching those men about sevenfold. At times I still get reports from those men how they're still getting sevenfold. And how God has multiplied it into their lives over and over and over again. You can sit back and either cry about it, wish you still had it. Or you can lift your hands and say, I found the thief and I want it back sevenfold. Be a father to me. Be a mother to me. Be a sevenfold. Come on and lift your hands and open up your mouth right now and just worship him. Whew. Somebody needs a sevenfold return. Somebody's ready to stop blaming their uncle for that molestation and stop blaming the devil that moved on him. Somebody's ready now to stop blaming their natural parents and stop blaming the enemy that moved to divide our family. How dare you come in and try to rip up my household? I want sevenfold. Hallelujah. And the Lord shall return it unto me. And the Lord shall prosper me. And the Lord shall maintain me until he sends it forth. And that's why God will let some stuff get stolen from you, honey. That's why some of your pain is so deep. Because God's trying to set you up with some sevenfold joy. Some sevenfold peace. Some sevenfold strength. Some sevenfold finances. You need a sevenfold dance. You need a sevenfold shout. What the enemy is meant for evil, God has meant it for good. You got to excuse me, but I got to, hey. You got to get your seven. You better get that sevenfold dance on because...
Go, go to Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verse 24. Psalm 118, verse 24. Uh, we're going to have to take this to a, another level. Psalm 118, verse 24. Because some of y'all, bless your hearts, you just stand there like mannequins. Bless your little palpitating heart. And so God's going to have to help you gain some more understanding. Uh, so look at this. This is the day the Lord has made. What? We will rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. Rejoice and be glad in it. Now, you must understand the Hebrew word for rejoice. The Hebrew word for rejoice means to turn one's body around with violent emotions. And, and the concept is simply this, that as easy as I can turn my body around, God can turn my situation around. Maybe you don't got nothing to turn around. Maybe that's why you're still sitting there. But somebody's got the revelation that I'm getting ready to re... I'm getting ready to rejoice. Tell your neighbor, sorry, get out of my way. I'm really sorry, but I got some stuff to rejoice over. I, I need some sevenfold return. I need for God to turn some stuff around. Rejoice! And again I say... I refuse to let the football stadium be louder than the church. I refuse to let the baseball diamond be louder than the church. Because Jesus hit a home run for me. Jesus made a touchdown for me. Now, look at Psalm 34, verse 1. Psalm 34, verse 1, because I want somebody ready to take it up a little higher. Psalm 34, verse 1. Let, let's just go up a little bit higher with this. Uh, let, let's gain a little more understanding. Psalm 34, verse 1. And, 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 and the psalmist begins to tell us this. He said, listen, I'm in verse 1. He said, I will bless the Lord at... And his praise shall continually be in... Where's my praise? See, those of you that say, well, the Lord knows me, brother, and he knows the praises in my heart. He sure does know you. He knows you lying, because if it's in your heart, the Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall... Don't tell me it's in your heart and don't come out your mouth. Now, go to verse 2. Go to verse 2 right now, because we're coming down to what we want. Go to verse 2. He said, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear thereof, and be... Now verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name I'm about ready to get sevenfold, so what you need to do is get yourself a dancing partner. Just tell somebody beside you, I just need you to magnify him with me. Huh. Now maybe you and your partner might want to come up front, maybe you want to go to the aisle, maybe you want to go to the back. Because you're just going to tell your partner, we need some room. We need some room. So I want you to magnify the Lord with me. Whether you want to dance together, however you want to do it. But you're telling your partner, magnify the Lord with me. Because we get ready. Hey, don't you know that commercial? Don't you know when they put in the advertisements? When you have a tough stain, shout it out. So when you got a tough problem, honey, shout it out. Oh, magnify him with me. Mac, eh, 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 oh. Mac, oh, 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 Magnify him with me.
sevenfold, sevenfold, sevenfold. Ribe be be ko shatala mama ha shatala baha. Pastor, I need some oil. Oil, 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 oil. oil. Sevenfold, sevenfold, sevenfold. I want to tell you, I want to tell you why God has given you your building back better than what it was because the devil came through this place and tried to rip this building up but God said I'm giving you the building back <laughs> bigger bottle on the way oh stay here stay here man of God I need you just to lift your hands right to the Lord right there I heard the Lord tell me the journey over these last these last few years have been long but I hear the Lord speaking and he's declaring unto you man of God that he has anointed you with fresh oil and the Lord calls you a general you are his general that is raising up forces sergeants shall get up underneath you for you are training others that they may be able to oversee their own camp their own platoon and the Lord speaks to you that he is refreshing you and breathing a wind of refreshing so that what has drained you what has tired you out the Lord now from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet speaks forth a refreshing speaks forth new life speaks forth that there shall be new vigor for the enemy the enemy thought to wear you out the enemy thought to wear you out but God is renewing you 